Is one of your skills as a negotiator being someone who comes across as honest as you are in the film and that you have nothing to hide? How do you gain the trust of, of people? Um, I would say that my particular skill is not so much uh, negotiations as such, but my skill is being able to get people together who don't want to talk to each other. It takes years sometimes to build up their trust. And yes, um, I am open with them. I, I remember that in 1989, I was writing a book on the Irish hunger strikes. And um, in the middle of, I, I was visiting with all of the families of all the el 11 hunger strikers, other than the family of Bobby Sands. And they were beginning to open up to me after like three years of my kind of just plodding away, going and visiting them, sending them little parcels and things like that. And I came down with cancer. And, you know, literally every week I would have chemotherapy on a Thursday and hop on a plane that night and kind of spend the entire night in the bathroom throwing up, get to Belfast the following morning, work through until Monday, and go back and do chemotherapy again on Thursday. Well, I told them I had cancer. And their attitude towards me completely changed. We now had something in common. We were both suffering. And that suffering was a bond where... Cancer was a blessing for me. They opened up in a way they never would have opened up. Never have opened up had I been just somebody coming and visiting the, them. So it takes time. Everything is slow. You have to build, gain the trust of people. Then you have to show them why it is worthwhile to go and talk to the other. And Martin McGuinness said it very well or was John Alderdice quoting Martin McGuinness when he said, you have a choice between talking now, talking 10 years from now, or being talking 25 years from now, but in the end you're going to have to talk. That's how all conflicts end unless there's total obliteration. And in these kinds of conflict, intrastate conflicts, ethnic conflicts, religious conflicts, they never get to that point. Some of them will go on a very, very long time. The Sunni-Shia divide will go on maybe for a generation. But we had religious wars in Europe, uh, which we forget. We, we don't look back on our own, the history of Western civilization and the religious wars that were fought. Uh, and we have to put things in the perspective, not just of the moment, uh, but of, our, of the historical landscape over hundreds of years from which we can draw lessons as to how human beings behave and what they fight over, so that many of the conflicts that are going on today are different in kind, but not in the, the, the basic substance of what the conflict is about. Today, we have far more sophisticated weaponries, and of course, everything is instantaneously brought into our living rooms, not just our living rooms, we just have to take the iPhone out and have a look, or the other phone and have a look, and we, we can see what's happening any place in the world. But that works two ways. Every poor, deprived person, every person living in conflict also has a phone and also sees what's going on. So information has collapsed, and there's no time for analysis. It's now and the next instant, and there's no in-between. The nature of warfare has changed. So um, I don't think you're going to see in the future the kind of wars that existed in World War I and World War II. But we now live in an age where because of the technology that exists, anybody, just about anybody, can make a bomb of one description or another. And we have seen that Already, we saw it with the two young men who carried out the Boston uh, Marathon bombers 
we see it in 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 in, in Paris for some of the uh, bombs were kind of homemade bombs. All you've got to do is go to the local store and buy the ingredients, and everything is available on online. How to make a bomb? A pound of this, a half a pound of that. Pour some sauce here. It's like making a cake. And anyone who has a grievance can use a bomb. And increasingly, we will see that will be the case, because there are at least 300 million young people who live across the world on the very margins of our society. They are forgotten. Now, our politicians tell them that they will get jobs and they'll get education. They're never going to get those things. Never. And as the world shrinks because of globalization, and they see the opportunities that other people and other countries have that they will never, never enjoy, that creates rage. And it's so simple. Cre making a dirty bomb, one that could, if it went off at a place like New York, would kind of kill about um, instantaneously about maybe 100,000 people, and probably people trying to get out of the city 200,000 people with all communications gone, with people totally unprepared how to deal with situations like that. A dirty bomb is within the capacity of any jihadist or any terrorist group or anybody who's mentally ill to make, and you can put it in the post. And that's the kind of world we're going to have to live in, that the technology we have created has become so sophisticated that that technology can kill us. And there's kind of an irony in that, that as we think technology improves our lives, at the same time it provides the means of destroying our lives. <laughs>